Hi, and welcome to this issue of the Neurology Journal Club. We're thrilled to be able to talk about this paper today by Dr. Bears, Dr. Van Doren, and colleagues. It's entitled SARS-CoV-2 Vaccination Safety in GBS, CIDP, and Multifocal Motor Neuropathy. I'm Jeff Allen. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, and I'm really honored to be joined here by Nick Purcell. Nick's a, currently a neurology resident at the University of Minnesota, and we're honored to have him as our incoming neuromuscular fellow next year. I'm going to turn it over to Nick in a minute just to talk about some of the methods and the results of this paper. But first, I want to put a little color on why this issue is really so important. And it's really so important because of the commonality of which we all receive vac vaccinations. Every time I or you go in to get an influenza vaccine, you're going to be asked, have you ever had GBS before or do you have CIDP? And if you answer yes, you're probably going to be asked to talk to your doctor about if you should or should not get the vaccine. And your doctor is probably going to advise against it. So naturally, with the emergence of a COVID vac vaccination campaign where billions of people across the globe are going to be vaccinated, this heightened this level of, of anxiety. But where does this, all this anxiety come from? Well, it really began in probably 1976 with the emergence of the swine flu and the national vaccination campaign within the United States. And in the wake of that campaign, there was observed an increased incidence of GBS on the order of about one increased case of GBS per 100,000. And so subsequent to that connection, and that was a very real connection, but subsequent to that, this whole concern with vaccination safety and those with GBS or CADP was really, was really heightened. And so this, this concern has bled over into subsequent influenza vaccines, even though subsequent to the 1976 campaign, the association between GBS and vaccination uh, has really been quite thin, where some studies have shown no increased risk, other has shown uh, increased risk on the order of one to two cases of GBS per, uh, per million vaccinations. So a pretty small risk. But nonetheless, this concern has bled over to subsequent uh, influenza vaccines and also non-influenza vaccines. You know, and now we have uh, all of these COVID vaccinations. So this whole idea of safety is a big concern and especially a concern for those people that already have GBS and, and CIDP and, and, and the men. So it's really an important issues. So with that, with that context, you know, this is what these authors were trying to do and what they tried to explore. So let's talk about what they, what they actually did. Great, thanks for that introduction. So let's dive into it. Uh, the study was a prospective multi-center a uh, cohort study conducted at three Dutch university hospitals. Uh, they included patients with a diagnosis of GBS, CD, CIDP, and multifocal motor neuropathy. Um, patients that had already received COVID vaccinations or had a COVID infection were excluded from this study. Right, so you had a, a prospective multi-center study uh, in the Netherlands. So I have a couple of questions about this diagnosis of, of GBS, CIDP, and MMM. We know that misdiagnosis of, of these conditions is quite high. So Nick, did the authors do anything to try to confirm that diagnosis in these patients? Yeah, they, they, they did. In fact, after uh, informed consent, they kind of scoured the medical records of all the patients that carried these diagnoses to uh, attempt to confirm them. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing. Um, obviously, we don't want to do a study like this and then realize that a lot of these people never had the disease that we were targeting. I got another question about you know the, the, the third bullet point you have here. Why were these patients that already received COVID vaccinations excluded? It was uh, an important distinction for this study to collect data prospectively, I think, uh, to avoid recall bias. Um, so if one already had the vaccine, they were not a part of the, the cohort. Right. Um, furthermore, let's see. So eligible patients uh, completed a baseline pre-vaccine visit. At this visit, basic demographic data and, and disease characteristics were recorded. Uh, patients were then evaluated within 48 hours of the first vaccine, 48 hours of the second vaccine. Um, and at each of these visits, disability, fatigue, quality of life outcomes were recorded. Um, these outcomes were used to, to capture the development of weakness, numbness, or disability that, that might have uh, developed. Um, patients were then evaluated a final time, uh, six weeks after the pre-vaccine visits. Um, if a patient, uh, elected not to get vaccinated, uh, they were evaluated with the same questionnaire, the final questionnaire, four months after the baseline visit. Uh, the primary outcome of the study uh, was defined as the development of uh, self-reported deterioration uh, in inflammatory neuropathy-related symptoms. Uh, for GBS, this was defined as the recurrence of symptoms, uh, new immunotherapy or hospitalization. Uh, for CIDP or MMN, uh, deterioration was defined as worsening of pre-existing symptoms 
new symptoms, change in treatment, or uh, subsequent hospitalization. That's great. So, so patients that were enrolled in the study, they were consented, they had a baseline visit before they had their vaccination, and then they had repeat visits before their first vaccination, before their second vaccination, and then at, at six weeks. Let's talk a little bit more about that primary outcome measure. So as I understand it, all these the assessments in this study that were used to determine relapse or reoccurrence or worsening were self-reported. Is that right? Correct. Uh, it was very logistically difficult and ultimately not possible to do objective tests uh, like grip strength or neurologic examinations. So it was all uh, self-reported. Yeah, that's, that's a logistically important point to, to make. And we'll swing back to this when we talk about some of the, the limitations of this study. The other thing I want to talk about is how people feel after they've been vaccinated. We've all been vaccinated and we all kind of feel crummy uh, for a day or two. How were those symptoms related to the vaccine separated from, from relapse or were those captured within that, that uh, potential deterioration of the neuropathy? Yeah, so they really tried to separate those uh, the best they could. Um, any change that was related just to fatigue or pain was uh, classified as nonspecific. Um, if it was a de decrease in the IROD score of more than four points, um, it was considered uh, uh, disease uh, specific as this four point change on the IROD disability scale is considered a, a minimally uh, clinically important difference and therefore kind of the threshold uh, for true functional change. Uh, this clinical difference uh, would be applied between the baseline and time points uh, three or four. Right, and it was important for the study you know, to exclude those symptoms, those deteriorations within 48 hours of vaccination. So if you had a worsening of some function, uh, functional assessment within 48 hours, it was attributed to the vaccine. But for a true you know, relapse of the inflammatory neuropathy, you're really looking at something that makes more sense from a, a timing standpoint. And that was after 48 hours, but before, before six weeks. So those, those changes really classified as a, as a disease associated worsening, not related to the, to the vaccination. All right, I think that's pretty clear. So let's talk, go on to the next slide and talk about what they, uh, the group of patients that they, they captured. Excellent, yeah. So uh, between the dates of uh, February, 2021 and August of 2021, um, 1,152 patients were invited to participate. Informed consent was signed by 674 of them. Um, upon chart review, 153 were excluded because of prior vaccines or because of uh, further chart review indicating that the inflammatory neuropathy diagnosis could not be confirmed. So of the 521 confirmed diagnoses, 195 had GBS, 248 had CIDP, and 78 had MMN. Um, a complete data set, uh, meaning you know, the patients that were uh, confirmed, vaccinated, and clean, uh, completed all of the follow-up questionnaires were available for 162 GBS patients, 188 with CIDP, and 53 with MMN. Right, yeah, so you had some dropout here along the way with patients either not getting vaccinated or earlier on where their disease could not be confirmed. You know, but it's, it's nice that there was uh, uh, a um, efforts made in order to confirm diagnosis. And then a lot of these patients went on to get, to get, get vaccinated. So we'll move on to the next slide to actually really talk about some of the characteristics of these, this group of, of patients. Yeah, great. So as far as these uh, baseline uh, characteristics, uh, not surprisingly, there was a slight predominance of, of males, uh, median age uh, in the mid 60s, consistent with historic demographics. Uh, we, we, we make note that of the CIDP, uh, those with CIDP, 73% were on immunotherapy. And of those with uh, MMN, 97% were on immunotherapy. Uh, almost all uh, with IVIG with some small portions of oral steroids and, and plasmapheresis as well. Uh, we also make note that in this cohort of Dutch participants, between 80 and 90% um, agreed to vaccination willingly. Um, as a total, um, and there might be an important point here later as we talk about, about the limitations and things, as a total of 844 vaccinations were administered to these 465 uh, participants. 65% were Pfizer, 15% AstraZeneca, 8% Moderna, 3% Johnson & Johnson. And the percent that elected not to get vaccinated were 4%. Right, so Nick, remind me, you know, there's different types of vaccines. What, how do the, what's the difference between these, these four vaccinations? Yeah, a AstraZeneca and J&J &J are the adenovirus preparations, while Pfizer and Moderna have the mRNA technology. Right, yeah, it's an important point. We'll swing that back to that, I think, in, in a little bit as well. So what, what did they find? What's the, what was the main observation from this cohort? Yeah, the meat of it here. So 
Of the 162 uh, GBS patients, uh, only one reported worsening uh, during the follow-up period. Um, upon review of the medical record uh, by the team, it was determined to be due to um, spinal stenosis. Uh, this person actually underwent sur surgical intervention with complete resolution and was definitively not a GBS recurrence. Um, of the CIDP patients, um, although 10 of the 188 reported worsening numbness or weakness, only five resulted in treatment change. Uh, all but one normalized within uh, about a month, four weeks, um, and that remaining one resulted within eight weeks. Uh, and every patient said that they were willing to be vaccinated again. Of the 53 multifocal motor neuropathy patients, only two reported worsening. One patient had a change in treatment and both normalized within four to six weeks. Um, I think looking at this data, I think it should be uh, noted that of the 12 CIDP and multifocal motor neuropathy patients that reported disease worsening, nine of 12 patients had fluctuating disease course before uh, any vaccination occurred. Um, we should also point out that 4% uh, of this cohort that did not get vaccinated, uh, one of the patients equal to 5% of the group reported worsening weakness um, and sensory symptoms during the observation window, meeting criteria for worsening of that inflammatory neuropathy. Yeah, so that's, that's a great way to summarize that. So if I can you know, put all that together again, I guess if you look at the GBS population, you had no occurrences of recurrent GBS that were, were convincing in that, in that group. If you look at the CIDP and MMN group combined, you had about 5% worse. And however, that was a similar percentage of the patients that were not vaccinated and followed during the same window. It's also important to note that during even those patients with CIDP and MMN that had a worsening, almost all had a, or a complete resolution of the symptoms within you know, six weeks. And almost all those patients wanted to go on and, and get vaccinated. So very, um, uh, important and uh, reassuring results. Let's talk a little bit about the limitations of, of the study. So we'll go back to the, the, the previous slide of the results. Nick, as I see it, there's there's probably three main limitations to, to this study. You wanna, you wanna chat about those? Yeah, I agree. I, I think they're very notable. So I, the, the, the first one uh, was how deterioration was defined. Um, objective assessment of these uh, neuropathy, uh, uh, worsening of the neuropathy uh, with measures such as grip strength and. Uh, neurologic exam was not feasible and ultimately not completed. Um, so they were, it, it was relied uh, completely on uh, self-reported symptoms um, to capture their deterioration. Um, you know, self-reporting symptomatic change in inflammatory neuropathies uh, can always lead to significant placebo and nocebo effects, especially in a setting like this with, with another factor, uh, which could account for some of the reported symptoms. It should be noted that only three of the patients uh, uh, did the change in the disability score reach this minimal clinical important difference. Um, and in 10 of the 12 patients, other explanations were, were observed, such as uh, a pre-vaccine fluctuation of symptoms. Yeah, this is a really important issue. It's, it's tough to do it and capture these types of changes within a study like this. It's also tough to capture them in, in clinical practice when we see patients, you know, they've got CADP, they got MMN, they get a vaccine, they say they're a little bit worse. How do we really know that they're, they're worse? And if we take the data that they learned, that they observed in this, this study, only three of those CIDP patients that reported worsening had a, an IRODS change that was above the MCID, the minimal clinical important difference. Um, that's a tough thing to, to know what, what to do with that. So when we see these patients in clinical practice, taking that extra step to try to you know, really confirm disease worsening through some sort of objective outcome measure, whether it's a disability score, or we see them in person and we check a strength score. I like to check grip strength or an MRC score or walking test or something else to really, really confirm their worsening, especially when it may mean the difference between adjusting treatment and the long-term treatment implications. I think it's a really important take-home message from, from this study is to try to reduce the worsening after vaccination or in other, other aspects as well, you know, but especially after vaccination to try to confirm that as, as best we can. But it's uh, admittedly, not not easy. Nick, uh, what are the limitations you think uh, we can point out in this study? Yeah, so I think that's the main one. I think uh, I think there are a couple others. Uh, secondly, um, is the size of the study. You know, although it includes a fairly large number of patients with inflammatory neuropathies, uh, when you're talking about rare events, you know, such as ones that that are described as one on one out of every hundred thousand or rarer, you know, this could be an extremely challenging to capture in a relatively small 
prospective study of this kind. <clears throat> yeah, this is just a numbers game. It's it's a it's a nice group, a nice size group of these patients, but you know, as you said, we're we're talking about very rare events, and so those are very challenging to capture. This will need you know, further studies going forward, epidemiological studies, to really you know understand these numbers in, in even more detail. Um, any other limitations? I think I think there's a third that's certainly worth mentioning, um, and that's the uh, different COVID vaccinations. You know, the mRNA and adenovirus vaccines may confer different levels of risk. Uh, by far, the most common vaccine administered in the study was Pfizer, um, and most of the reported deteriorations were with this vaccine. However, the number of inflammatory neuropathy worsenings were proportional uh, to the numbers of vaccines provided. You know, but but it, but it is worth mentioning that Pfizer was uh, was the most common. Yeah, and we've got some data on this for patients without pre-existing inflammatory neuropathies as far as recurrence of GBS or, or development of GBS in patients without a pre-existing inflammatory neuropathy. And based on some of the larger studies, we know that you know, the adenovirus vaccinations, AstraZeneca and J&J, there's been a reported about four to seven cases per million vaccinations. The same increased risk has not been as clearly shown with the mRNA vaccinations, the Pfizer and the, and the Moderna. So again, it's a numbers game and how these, there was so few of the adenovirus vaccinations administered, it'd be important to look at that in a, in a bigger group of, of patients to see if you know, maybe the, the risk of recurrence or worsening of, of inflammatory neuropathy is different among, among the different vaccinations. We also know that there's a risk of uh, GBS or worsening of inflammatory neuropathy after you actually get the COVID infection. And so balancing that risk between these different vaccinations and the actually getting infected, you know, is, is a very um, difficult thing to do with, with this, this paper. Um, but if you put all this together and you put together to what the authors found here, the results to me are, are very reassuring. And these, these risks and you know, benefits can be very challenging to, to weigh, but overall, no increased risk in GBS patients perhaps a small risk in CIDP and, and, and MMM worsening, but with some important limitations. So it, it helps us, I think, from an evidence-based standpoint, really put some, some evidence to and data behind weighing risks and benefits of vaccinations. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the last question over to Nick and I'll, I'll just paint a scenario here where you have a patient, patient with CIDP comes in to, to see you and they, they've had a challenging disease course but also they really don't want to get sick with COVID. And they ask you, you know, they're getting mis mixed messages here. Should you get the vaccination or should you not get the vaccination? Nick, what are you, how are you going to tell them? What are you going to respond? Yeah, to? I, I think that question is kind of the crux of the study. And based on the data that we now have, um, you know, vaccine is safe and effective, uh, even if you've had GBS or currently have CIDP or, or MMN. And while nothing is completely free from risks, the benefit, benefits of the vaccine in almost all cases outweighs the risk, you know. In short, I'd, I'd tell them to get the vaccination. Right, well said. I think you know rebalancing this risk-benefit um, you know calculus is really really important. So I think we're both of the opinion that this is this study gives us some much-needed reassurance uh, that vaccinations are safe, even in those that have had prior TBS, CADP, and, and MMN. So a very important point to inform uh, clinical practice. So with that, I want to thank everybody for listening on behalf of Nick. Um, Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk about this study. Thanks.